Okay, so on this 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time coming up here, Bishop, we've got we've got a longer gospel. I guess there's always an option, but it seems like a longer one compared to some of the ones we've had recently. But mm-hmm. um, but maybe we'll dive right into that. Yeah, I was speaking to the St. Anne's Men's Group last night, and one of the questions that I proposed for prayer, for prayer for reflection for any of us, all of us, is the question, am I a Eucharistic Catholic, we were talking about Eucharistic revival, am I a Eucharistic Catholic or am I a person who occasionally goes to Mass? Mm. And the difference between them being that a Eucharistic Catholic is a person, a Catholic, who organizes their whole life around the Eucharist because they have they have come to realize um, what an intimate encounter with Jesus it is, one, and what a gift it is, how much God desires to give us this gift, to have us receive it, so thus the importance of it. So that juxtaposed to a person who occasionally goes to Mass is a person who Mass is sort of like a Bible study or Mass is like a social gathering. Uh, mass is something that I can do or not do if I'm able to do it. And so you see the difference between the two. Jesus didn't die, and Jesus didn't say at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me, so that we could be people who occasionally go to Mass. He did that so that we could be people who are continually drawn into the intimacy of this love affair with him through the Eucharist. And so we do go to Mass weekly, or even more often, but it changes the whole reason why we go, and it changes how we live the rest of our life. So rather than, you know, arriving at the weekend and going to Mass, if we can make it fit among all the other things that we have to do, we arrive at the weekend and we don't do other things if it gets in the way of going to Mass. Right. Uh, So I think that's worth worth our reflecting on. Hmm as we get ready to talk about the gospel for this 27th Sunday. Uh, The gospel is still coming from Mark as we're in uh, the B cycle. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, what did Moses command you? And they replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, Because of your hardness of hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, What God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen. I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. So this is one of the Gospels that I think people uh, take to heart and and remember well, uh, find to be maybe challenging. Uh, This is one of those instances where something that happened in Scripture, Moses permitting a husband to write a bill of divorce, Moses was not advocating divorce. Moses was trying to regulate a worse practice of divorce, where Uh, women were dismissed from homes just willy-nilly with no rights at all and and with no reasoning. 
uh, at the whim of a husband. And so Moses is trying to regulate that and say, look, this is not what God intends. You have to at least do X. So he's moving things in the in the right direction. Jesus takes it all the way uh, and says what God intended from the beginning was for this two-in-one flesh union. That's how the church conceives of the sacrament of marriage. So rather than a natural union uh, based just in human nature of two and one, uh, in the sacrament of marriage, the two become one with each other and God. God enters into a covenant, and they're able to receive and give to one another the power of that uh, covenant, that graced relationship, including with God. I think, though, that that the challenge of marriage and the challenge of divorce, of course, we have in, in the, the country this idea of no-fault divorce, and it's so important for us to remember that often someone is left in a marriage. That's, that's what often happens is a partner who does not want a divorce is left. Uh, sometimes it happens that it's a mutual, uh, a mutual sense of separating and divorcing. But in all cases, there's some kind of pain that's involved in this, and people who have gone through it often feel traumatized by the whole experience. And so the church both wants to uphold the reality of sacramental marriage and at the same time to be the mass unit, the, the ministering home of people who have been harmed by divorce. Uh, when the church uh, talks about uh, marriage being possible only once and the marriage bond being unbreakable, that's not to, to burden people with something that's impossible. It's to recognize something that has happened. So uh, mm-hmm. the church doesn't use the, the term of divorce. The church talks about a declaration of nullity after a divorce has happened But a declaration of nullity is not, quote, a Catholic divorce. It is, in fact, a Catholic who comes to the church and says, my marriage has ended in a civil divorce, and that uh, event has caused me to doubt whether I had a covenant marriage, a sacramental marriage at all, would you, the church, this person is asking the church, would you please investigate this union that I had to see is there any reason to doubt or any reason to think that the sacramental bond did not happen? And all of that is based on something that's just very normal uh, or easily able to understand Marriage is not a magic act. Marriage doesn't happen magically. Marriage happens through uh, confirmed or or through valid consent. Two people who have the capacity to understand what they're doing, who have the critical faculty of being able to understand what this consent will mean if they do it, if they give it, the fact that it will create an unbreakable union— Uh, and who desire to do that, and who desire to do that with God. When those two people do that, when that does happen, then that creates the sacrament of marriage, and that's not something the church even has the authority to, to break. But there can be defects in the consent that prevent it from happening And an easy way for people to understand it is imagining a scenario in which uh, two people went through all the stuff that Catholics go through to get married. They went through the long preparation process, and they filled out all the forms, and they had the big church wedding, and there was a keg at the reception and everything. Uh, So everything about a Catholic uh, wedding, but one of them was thinking to themselves— I don't think I really want to do this, but I'm going to try it and see how it goes. 
Even if they said the vows, that person is not forming valid consent. That person is withholding something. The other person will not know that. They don't know that, that that's what's happening at the day of their marriage. But if the marriage later ends in divorce and in the investigation for the declaration of nullity, it is discovered that the other person was really withholding valid consent. Then you can see that no sacramental union could have come into being because God would not have made that a covenant. God knows what's in our heart, and God knows that this person was withholding consent. So that's the the church's way of understanding whether a sacrament has happened or not. And if a sacrament has happened, then there's a bond there that the church cannot break. If the sacrament has not happened, then the persons are free to marry. And that's important because they might want to marry. Mm -hmm. They haven't been married yet. They went through a wedding, but they haven't yet been in a marriage or a sacramental marriage. They have been in a civil marriage. The children are legitimate children of the, of the mother and the father, if there are any children. But that's been a civil marriage all this time. It was thought to be yep. sacramental, but yep. it was not known. Bishop, what's your advice to couples who are, you know, maybe they be question, they'll, they're questioning this, maybe, maybe not at even this level of, you know, was there consent in my marriage or are struggling with, whatever it may be, communication, unity, et cetera. What's your advice to them? You know, where, where should people be looking? What, what should people be doing? Well, I think that the, this gospel and the challenge of, of making a sacramental marriage, of, of giving valid consent, that should cause all young single people who are thinking about that to recognize marriage is not something to take lightly, Getting married is not something to take lightly. One should discern carefully, do I think God is calling me to marriage? Which means, do I think God is calling me to live in this kind of a union? A till death do us part, two in one flesh union, open to the good of children. And if I do think that God is calling me to that, then I move forward with trying to find the person to marry, the right person to marry, there is no such thing as a Mr. or a Mrs. Wright. We've gone through all that in past episodes of Tulsa Time, uh, marriage preparation and dating and courting and discerning the right person. Uh, two people need to be two people who want to marry each other. They don't marry each other because they think the other person is Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. That would be a mistake. The other person is the one that I choose to marry and the one that chooses to marry me. That's it. They don't marry this other person because they're so holy they're not a sinner. Nope. We're all sinners. There's no, there's no person you can find on the earth who is not a sinner. And if you marry a sinner and you are a sinner, you should expect that in the marriage there will be sins <laughs> committed against each right. other. Right. Not because we're trying to hurt each other, but because it we're weak and ignorant, and sometimes we act out of passion, and we harm each other, and we should uh, heal those things that happen. And life is hard. And life is hard. Life is hard whether you're married or not. Life is hard, and you're going to have disappointments, and you're going to feel times of dissatisfaction whether you're married or not. So the fact that you're married and having a difficult time you should not allow the evil one to begin to insinuate in your mind that this is because you're married, and this is because you're married to this person. Mm -hmm. That's not it. Yeah. So take your time. You know, recognize that sometimes life has seasons of suffering. Take your time and begin to work together on that. What are the issues? And get help if you need it. There are lots of good counselors uh, people who can help you to sort out what are the issues. When you think of the complexity of human communication, <laughs> say it two ways, when you think of how easy it looks to communicate well, it looks like I should just be able to talk and they should just totally understand everything I say. 
But then you discover, <laughs> no, actually, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Then it it helps you to understand why it's going to be natural in a union like a marriage that often there will be miscommunication. And if the two people don't work together on communication skills, those miscommunications may cause harm and hurt, and that builds up over time. Well, don't let that happen. Uh, I used to talk to couples about uh, the um, marriage, what do we call it? Uh, Marriage encounter, marriage encounter retreats. And that marriage encounter retreats were sort of like people who take their car for maintenance to to the shop. Yep. Every day, a man and a woman, husband and wife, drive their marriage like a car. Yeah. It's what gets them through the day. It's what helps them raise their family, get the kids off to school, all the things. But every now and then, they should take some time apart, just the two of them, and lift the hood on the marriage itself and talk about how are we doing? How are we... Um, use marriage as a verb, marriaging, you know, how are we doing this marriage thing? How's our communication? Please give me some feedback. What are things that I do or don't do that would be helpful to you in terms of communication? Uh, how's our respect for each other? Please give me some feedback. How, how do you feel like, am I respecting you? What are things that I do that may be yeah. uh, causing you to think I don't respect you fully? So those kinds of things would be helpful. Yeah, and marriage brings out a, a lot of good. Um, and so I think that it's it's good to reflect on that. You know, your car analogy is pretty apt. But I mean, just, uh, you know, in thinking about it, um, you know, when you get married and when you jump into this partnership, when you're marriaging, if you will, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you're you bringing about so many goods. It's two people coming together to unite, hopefully on a common goal. Um, and it's bringing about children. It's bringing about, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it can even bring out more wealth, you know, if both of you have great careers, you know, and, and not that that's our goal in marriage, right. but it can bring out all these goods. And then, you know, one desire, one good, healthy desire of one person in the marriage may, you know, become a good, healthy desire that the other person didn't have, you know, mm-hmm. and you can learn from one another and things like right. that. So there's a lot of goods to be had. But I think it's a strong point to to notice when, you know, is this building up? Am I building up a, do I have a narrative around my spouse, mm-hmm. you know, um, and things like that. Sometimes I think about like, what's the most painful common denominator in my life or what's the most annoying, like sort of the the squeakiest wheel gets the grease kind of a thing or like, you know, just the one the most annoying thing is going to annoy me the same amount, whether it's this really huge issue or a really small issue. Mm-hmm. So am I just frustrated all the time or am I just, yeah. you know, am I dealing with what's going on? Am I communicating well with my spouse? So yeah. um, I think it's a, I think it's a strong point, but um, sort of transitioning Bishop uh, just this past weekend as this episode airs on the 30th, you know, we just actually um, mm. went through uh, the burial of, of Bishop Slattery, Bishop Edward yeah. Slattery. And um, yeah. um, just kind of briefly, you know, he, um, he served our diocese for um, 22 years um, as as bishop and was your um, predecessor. You are his successor. And so um, uh, he served in the Archdiocese of Chicago um, before coming here. So he was a priest of the Archdiocese. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a, a small fun fact. I He was the associate pastor at St. Jude the Apostle in South Holland. South Holland is a, is a suburb of Chicago. There's 400 parishes in the Archdiocese of Chicago, seven vicariates, and then deaneries within each vicariate. We have vicariates in this diocese, but they're really the size of deaneries in like Chicago. So anyways, but he served as St. Jude the Apostle. Um, prior to my arrival to the Diocese of Tulsa, I served in the Archdiocese of Chicago for mm-hmm. a number of years um, for Focus and then for the Archdiocese. And we were working on a campaign, and I actually ran a campaign in South Holland um, at a parish uh, nearby St. Jude. And I actually have been in the parish offices of St. Jude randomly. Um, and so it's just kind of funny. Every time I read his story, read his bio that he was at St. Jude and he and I actually bonded over that, um, when I arrived here, um, oh, wow. and just talked about, um, different things like that. And, uh, he and I were fortunate enough at very different generations of time in Chicago, but, um, yeah. we actually had some common relationships through serving the church, um, you know, years and years apart. 
Um, so yeah. it's kind of a neat, but he was a neat, neat, neat man and a, and a holy man. And so, um, yeah, just, uh, how was he instrumental to you? And, and yeah, I like the, thoughts? the little, uh, do you call it a YouTube short, mm -hmm. the short that you guys put together, a communication department put together with his pictures of him as a little boy and oh yeah, as a grade school kid. And then in the seminary and it's a wonderful way to see a person's life. Uh, when when I was called by the nuncio to to be told that I was becoming to Tulsa, when when that happens, when that kind of call happens, the next call that you have generally is from the bishop of the place where you're going, uh, because the nuncio once he hears from the man who says yes, I will uh, accept this assignment then calls that bishop and says, okay, the bishop who's replacing you will be X. And so within the hour of, of talking to the nuncio, I got the call from Bishop Slattery. Wow. And for anyone who knows him, uh, he had this really calm and fatherly kind of a voice. You he know, did. This great, yes. gorgeous voice. Absolutely. And um, he was, <laughs> he having been through it, understood that I was in a hyped up, emotional state at that moment. And so he was being very calm on the phone and and um, telling me, oh, it's wonderful to talk to you and and I look forward to meeting you and you're going to love the diocese here. We've got great priests and great parishes. And so that was my first encounter with him. I had never heard his name before. Right. Uh, I mean, I knew so little about Tulsa. I knew nothing about Tulsa, basically. And uh, so that was my first even knowing that there was a Bishop Slattery anywhere. Uh, but coming here, uh, he was very welcoming, of course, and, and uh, he had been praying and the diocese had been praying for the person who would replace him. So I had already had lots of people praying for me. And so often, even now, um, you know, as the bishop now for eight years here, I recognize and and am thankful for how easy my life is uh, because of his good work. So, you know, we have a really healthy endowment for our seminarians, for example. I came from a diocese where the seminarian budget line was the largest budget line in the budget and had to be covered every year uh, from the budget. And so... It's a great gift to our diocese to have this healthy endowment that's able to help us to afford the, the education of our seminarians. He had already uh, had a successful campaign that among the things that it produced was a rural parish fund, a fund to help rural parishes. Well, this diocese is a rural diocese, a mission diocese. And so having that fund helps us a lot. Uh, with our rural uh, communities because they're so small. Mm -hmm. There's many things that they wouldn't be able to afford to do, uh, even just in terms of maintenance and upkeep of churches and buildings without that. The the first event that I did was the, the news, uh, what do you call it, a news? Like uh, a press, press conference? Press conference. Uh, announcing that I was coming, and he and I went to Catholic Charities to do that. And so they showed me the tour of the whole Catholic Charities. <laughs> My mind was swimming about a lot of things that day, but seeing that I was coming to a diocese that had that amazing uh, Catholic Charities ministry was very comforting. And then... Um, the, uh, the other endowments that we have, the tuition endowment, the St. Francis of Assisi tuition endowment yep. fund um, is another, you know, our Catholic... Uh, Catholic schools. Catholic schools fund, our CFEO, Catholic Foundation of yeah. Eastern Oklahoma. So there's so many things that he worked hard on and the people here worked hard on before I came, uh, things that he led and led successfully that really helped the diocese now to be in a very solid uh, place. So those are things that I reflect on. And then 
just in terms of the the way that he faced his illness at the end, uh, he had had a pretty healthy life. You know, he had he was grateful that he had not had long periods of illness in his life before, and at the end, it was difficult. It was a difficult uh, time of illness at the end. He had the wonderful and very loyal care of Monsignor Branken uh, to assist him through all of that. But it was difficult, and, and it took a man of courage and faith uh, to face that the way he did. Uh, and So that was a, a good model, I think, uh, of a person who accepts that death is a part of life and death brings me home to the Father. And he really believed that that's where he was going. Mm-hmm that the, the Blessed Mother was there to accompany him. And so your comments on his fatherly voice, um, I think ring true for a lot of people. I think I'm, I know that folks who have gone to spiritual direction uh, with Bishop Slattery over the years. And um, yeah, I just always enjoyed, you know, at least for the first, oh gosh, maybe his first three or four years of retirement um, pre COVID, um, I guess you could say, I mean, he would, he would come to the chancery, mm-hmm. I don't know if it was weekly, at least monthly Pretty or every other week. Yeah, maybe it was mm-hmm. weekly. And so, uh, you know, you'd see him around. I mean, yeah. and would chat with him about this or that or family or how things are going. Always had a big smile on his face mm-hmm. whenever you saw him. And so I always thought it was kind of fun um, mm-hmm. just having a bishop, you know, a retired bishop, you know, um, and he has, he had an office here at the Chancery. Maybe some people don't even know that, but he still had an office here. I always thought that that was a really cool thing mm-hmm. um, that you made sure that he had an office here at the Chancery to do business meetings and things like that. And so, um, you know, it was always fun to kind of have him around and see him around. It's, you know, you'd walk into the office one day and there's Bishop Slattery standing there talking to some folks. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was always great to see him. I mean, just had an incredible yeah. presence about him, a very calming presence. And Well, in the house enjoyed. I live in, you know, that was the house he built. Mm-hmm. And so he and Monsignor lived there during those last years of his time before he retired. And so uh, when I'm living in that house, I think of all the different kinds of social events and things that he would have had there. And so, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. What did you learn from him? Or is there anything from his sort of legacy? I mean, everybody likes to talk about legacy. I mean, but just is there anything that you've sort of taken or, or any sort of resolutions that you're like, yeah, I really want to make sure that I um, do my best to continue his legacy in this way or, yeah. um, or what was, you know, what was something unique maybe about him that you think? You know, he, I really he ran um, Catholic extension before he became a bishop. So that's yet another way that he helps us even still today because Catholic extension is a very healthy organization and we're one of the mission dioceses. There's about uh, 50 of them that Catholic Extension helps to fund. And so uh, even that, you know, there's a way in which he helps us even with that. But, you know, the thing that that I would point to is that he was a man of serious uh, spirituality and a focus on that. You know, he wanted uh, in the diocese, he wanted there to be good prayer, good liturgy, uh, he wanted his priests to be men of prayer and holiness. And so as important as all the administrative things are within a diocese, that's not what the diocese exists for. Those are things that it needs to help it exist, but it exists for conversion of people, a conversion of hearts, uh, for the making of disciples. And that was something that he focused on and something that I still try to to focus on today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So kind of bridging the gap here between the gospel and sort of Bishop Slattery's story, just kind of a, I guess, a final question for you is just, in what ways can we hope in the kingdom of God as a child, as be, as mm-hmm. uh, Jesus says in the gospel, while facing the reality of our own death? Well, and that's the, the piece of the gospel we didn't talk about, but there is that, it almost seems like another gospel. It does because, when you read it. Yeah. All of a sudden, we go from marriage and and divorce and so forth. We go to people bringing children to Jesus. And they're all treating the children the way children were treated in those days. And children were to be seen and not heard. And, um, uh, you know, they were treated as being less worthy or less digni- dignity. 
but Jesus, you know, in any of the gospel accounts where he encounters children, it seems like there's always somebody there who's saying, look, he's too busy to be messing with these little rugrats. Get them out of here. Move them away from here. And he always rebukes that. And he always stops and says, no, let those children come over here. In the gospel, he says, let them come to me to not pre- prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And he's always saying to us, unless you become like a child, unless you have a childlike trust in me, unless you develop a relationship with me in which I'm not just another person in your life, but I'm the person in your life, the same way that a child looks at their father or a child looks at their mother, um, Unless you do that, you you yourself can't enter the kingdom. And so uh, Bishop Slattery was certainly someone who took that to heart because his own uh, relationship with God, the thing that he preached out of and that he led out of, was certainly that of a child who has complete trust in the Father. Mm-hmm. You know, our death is 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 something that we don't like to think about to the degree that we're not really focusing on this relationship with the Father. Uh, we, we just had a retreat with some, uh, some of our priests, the St. Timothy's Fellows Retreat, which focuses on life in the Father's house, the house of the Father. The more that we focus on our life in the Father's house, the fact that we are not going to be here forever, I'm not going to be here beyond another 40 years, I don't think. Uh, The fact that we're destined to return to the Father's house, the more that we focus on that, the less we have to fear from death and the less we will fear death. And so I think that's something that Bishop Slattery uh, did in his own illness is he was focused on the Father's house, so he wasn't afraid of death. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, a great man, a great story, and so continued prayers for his family, and mm. um, and uh, may he rest in peace. Yeah. Well, thank you all for listening. This has been Tulsa Time with Bishop Condorla. We hope you have a good rest of your week. 